Hello, I'm Dr. Laura and welcome to Where Work Meets Life. I'm very excited about uh, this episode today with Detective Dave Sweet. I'm so grateful that he's joining the podcast for two episodes and I met him in a very unusual scenario, which I will explain uh, in these episodes. And I find him very inspiring, impactful, and interesting as a human being. He's very eclectic in what he does and in what he brings to the world. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Detective Sweet. He's a 23-year member of the Calgary Police Force. And within that time, he spent 20 years specializing in investigative uh, services. And his experience have been around drugs, guns, gangs, organized crime, missing persons, and homicide. So a very um, intense and not without many challenges type of career path. He has worked in the drug unit as well as organized crime as well, and he presents at law enforcement conferences and to various community groups. So in law enforcement, he's definitely a leader and um, an expert. Uh, and on top of that, he's been interviewed on several podcasts and documentaries. Uh, he's been on CBC's The Detectives, um, among other uh, television shows and episodes. He's received awards for his career, including Distinguished Service Award in 2010 and 18, the Chief's Award for Investigative Excellence in 2017, and the Governor General's Exemplary Service Medal in 2021. So this is a career uh, worth clapping for and being inspired by. A strong self-starter, a coach, a community leader, someone who lives by the mantra to love people and believes in the inner strength of, of people and making a difference in the world through the charity work he does, which we will discuss on the second episode. So welcome to the podcast, Dave. Thank you, Dr. Laura. It is just such a pleasure to have you. And today we are going to talk about tragedy as our teacher, finding the silver linings. So without further ado, Dave, I know I've said a lot about you, but can you tell us who you are from your perspective? Yeah, sure. So I'm, uh, I'm a 24 uh, year member of the Calgary Police Service. Um, and like you said, I've spent uh, much of my career uh, being involved in investigations. I spent some time as an undercover uh, uh, police officer when I was working in the drug unit and moved into organized crime and gang investigations and uh, was uh, invited to join the uh, homicide unit in uh, June of 2009. So I have about 13 and a half years in there now. And uh, it's been a place where I uh, certainly uh, have, uh, have learned that it's so important to try and find silver linings in often tragic types, uh, situations and scenarios, just to kind of be able to survive the day in that office. No kidding. So I wanna know more about your book, Skeletons in My Closet, Life Lessons from a Homicide Detective. Tell us what inspired you to write it. Sure, so, you know, I guess, um, the book is sort of written with a scar in mind, and the scar is is uh, to recognize that uh, you know I know so well that uh, tomorrow's not promised for any of us. I mean that's just a, a reality. And so um, a few years back, I wanted to start kind of building towards a legacy, so that uh, one day um, my children or my grandchildren or my great grandchildren could learn a little bit about me. And so uh, I partnered with uh, a co-author, uh, the talented Sarah Graham, and uh, we collaborated on a, on a project to basically bring uh, a memoir uh, uh, to fruition uh, about my career and the things that I've learned. Um, you know, it's very unfortunate, my, ch well, fortunate and unfortunate, but, you know, my children would see me off and I'd be gone for long hours and they had no idea on uh, maybe where I was up to or where I was going. Um, but all that time I was learning things and I wanted to bring some of those lessons or some of those things that I was learning back to them that one day they could maybe read and learn a little bit about what was going on uh, when I wasn't at home. Wow. And, and what a legacy. So I read that book. It was a couple of years ago now, and it was just so interesting and 
powerful. And I mean, some of the stories disturbing, but what I really appreciated was each had a message, a silver lining to learn from the case. So what have people said about the book? How has the book impacted people, Dave? Well, I think, uh, I mean, for the most part, it's been very positive. Uh, we were invited to uh, um, Lincoln in uh, in England, actually to pre present at the British Criminology Society. And our presentation was based around this idea of bridging the gap between what we expect the police are, bridging that gap uh, between who we really are and uh, sort of how we uh, are all part of the same community. And so um, I think the book on some level has been a bit of a, um, uh, I'm hoping anyways, builds a few bridges uh, when we think of the police and the public and recognizing that we're one and the same. Right. We're all, police are our friends, right? Not Not to be feared. And I think the book really bridges that that gap for sure. And I'm curious how people can get a copy of this book. Sure. So uh, now uh, the book is available on Amazon. Um, and that is sort of our primary uh, platform that we're selling the book from. Um, it, it has been in the past. And of course, people can order it through Chapters and Indigo and some of the larger book chains. But uh, we direct most people just to Amazon at this point. Gotcha. So I'm going to tell the story of how I learned about your book. So we were going through a tragedy in our family, and this episode is around tragedy as our teacher. So I'm going to be open with, with you folks about uh, what happened. So what happened was our, our niece and great niece, Jasmine and Aaliyah, were missing um, and later it was discovered that this was a homicide and Dave was the lead detective on the case. And, and we can't thank him enough for all the courage and hard work and creative policing that was done to bring justice. And I was going through that period of time where I was quite upset about what was happening and praying for the girls to be found um, etc. And a, a girlfriend of mine said, I was at this book signing at, at Indigo and I met this detective sweet and he wrote this book. Um, and it brought me to tears when I was talking to him because I had been dealing with something difficult in my own life. And I thought of you, Laura, for this book, right? And I didn't know who detective sweet was at that time. And then um, I got to meet you a couple of weeks later at the funeral and I was standing beside this person at the graveyard and I didn't know who it was. And it was Detective Sweet that my friend said, I must have this book. Hmm. Very nice. So that's what happened. So I think it's, it's just such a small world. And I can attest that that book has definitely impacted many people as well as your presence and how approachable you are um, as a human being, Dave. Well, I mean, for myself, anyways, I think, uh, well, we all have a part to play in. I, w one of the one of my favorite sayings is uh, "love people," and I and I think that uh, if you kind of leave the uh, leave the door every day with that uh, that principle in mind, um, it does make you approachable. It makes you sort of, um, um, yeah. I hopefully it it, it uh, sort of softens. Uh, people to you on some level, I guess. Um, and it allows you to have uh, greater impacts in people's lives if you get that opportunity. So, Absolutely. And some of the people you come across, I can imagine, are very difficult to love uh, in your work. True. Uh, you know, but, you know, there is a saying out there that, uh, you know, the hardest people to love are the ones that need it the most. And so if we kind of keep that in mind... Um, yeah, some of them are. Some of them are difficult to love, but uh, but there's still an opportunity to show some level of compassion or some level of understanding or that kind of thing for most people that we we deal with. Right. Which brings me to so you you've written this book. I understand you're continuing to write another book. So tell us what's next in your writing career, Dave. Yeah, so I've uh, teamed up with a second co-author uh, to produce our second book, which I'm hoping will be out in the spring of uh, 2023. And uh, its working title right now is Undaunted. I don't know if that's going to be the 
the end title, but uh, we're sort of exploring courage and uh, all of the virtues or attributes or qualities of uh, uncommon people, what things we look at look to uh, maybe be inspired by. And so this isn't so much a memoir about me, but it's more about some of the amazing families and people I've met along the way, including police officers, um, uh, firefighters, paramedics, uh, and of course, families that have been dealing with uh, from very difficult situations. But uh, through all of them uh, and their stories of courage, uh, the hopefully the book will go on to inspire people to maybe uh, do something they challenge themselves to something they maybe wanted to do, but never had the strength to do before. Wow. So to follow their, a dream that they've had or uh, something on their bucket list, Dave? Yeah, it could be anything. I mean, almost everything we do in the world, I think, there has to be some level of courage behind it, you know? Um, and uh, and this, this is going to sort of, uh, on a grand stage, I hope anyways, highlight some of the more amazing courageous people that I've come across uh, in my time. And it's not just physical bravery that we're talking about. I mean, we're talking about people that have come up with new ideas. They're innovative. They're uh, uh, inventive. Um, they can be spiritual. They can believe in something. These are all sort of products of courage. And these are the types of things that we want to um, sort of highlight in this next book. So it'll be a variety of different stories of courageous people and courage coming out in different forms? That's right. Yeah. So uh, the literature suggests that there's about six different types of courage. And then we've broken that down into virtues and qualities of what made those people courageous. So whether or not it's uh, their ability to use logic or their ability to be, again, innovative as an example, or the ability to believe or to manifest their own in uh, their own outcomes in life, those types of things. Oh, I just can't wait to to get my hands on it. And I hope that spring 2023 brings it into this world, births it into the world, Dave. I hope so too. I think it'd uh, be great. And I really, it's a tip of the hat to some really amazing people that I've met along my way. And uh, if uh, I hope everyone feels that that's exactly what its intention is, is to tip the hat and say, you know, you inspired me. And your story should go on to inspire others. And so hopefully that will happen. Beautiful. Beautifully put. So I know that you write or you partner with a writer and co-author books. I know that you also are an impactful speaker. And I saw it myself a few weeks ago at an event called An Evening with Detective Sweet. And it was around Halloween and it had kind of a... I guess, a spooky or darker theme to it, um, but it was captivating. You could hear a pin drop in that audience. And what I want to say is that uh, I think you come alive at, at the mic. You, you love being at the mic. So tell us more about what types of topics you speak on and how you see your speaking career moving forward, Dave. Yeah, so, I mean... It's sort of, it's it's developing. Of course, uh, I have to be very conscious of the fact that I am still an active duty member with the, the police service. And so um, uh, I may be able not to speak about a wide range of topics at this point in time, but I'm slowly developing uh, uh, a few different presentations. One of the uh, ones that seems to touch a lot of people and I've been a keynote on several times is a presentation called an unconventional classroom. And it's really, again, it's sort of trying to um, hopefully have audiences and people that are participating in the, in the program, see that this great world that we live in is a, is a, is a place where we can do all sorts of learning outside of the walls of any classroom. And probably for most of us, um, the things and the lessons that we do learn in our day-to-day -day lives are ones that we're going to remember much, you know, beyond, again, sort of our grade school years and things of that nature. And so uh, that's a presentation where, again, I take people through a, a memoir-y type of uh, approach to explain to them the types of things that I've learned uh, through my career in law enforcement uh, with the hope that they can, like, look at their own lives and realize that they're learning things too. And those things should be shared uh, with people that are important to them so that they can learn through their experiences. Wonderful. So I'm wondering, because, you, I mean, you balance a lot. You're full-time uh, with the... Calgary Police 
force. You're also writing, speaking, and doing charitable work. Um, how do you find time to stay well? So what does work-life wellness look like for you, Dave? Well, for me, it's just having that balance of um, dealing with some, you know, pe some people would say negative uh, uh, aspects of, you know, working in a career in homicide uh, and balancing that with some really, really positive things uh, that you're doing around people. But um, I balance it all through the sort of notion of service. So uh, if I'm serving, uh, uh, say, a charitable organization, uh, the pro, the, and the organization, uh, one of the big ones that I support is Gems for Gems, which is an organization empowering women that are, um, uh, have survived intimate partner violence and uh, are uh, looking for, uh, uh, you know, a new start. Um, whether it's uh, doing that type of work or coaching hockey or playing hockey or um it gets me out into the community and around some really, really, again, amazing people. And that helps offset for me anyway, some of the negative experiences that I have maybe at work or what some people would view to be negative experiences at work. Right. So constantly in, in service in one shape, way, shape or form, as well as taking the time for physical activity, um, getting the energy out that way. Yeah, I mean, I think more more than physical activity for me, it's just uh, believing that I, I I really work hard to try and bring value to other people's lives, and I enjoy uh, meeting people that bring value to mine. Wonderful, and your network must be so diverse. I mean, people from every aspect of life, really. Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, um, it is true. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm touched by a number of different people. But at the end of the day, everybody kind of wants the same thing, right? Is to be acknowledged, to be heard, um, and uh, to share their own stories. And so, uh, and I like to do it as well, obviously. I mean, this is why I'm talking to you today, Dr. Laura. Uh, and it's it's really important uh, to me anyways, to sort of feel like I'm living a life that matters through the service of other people or to the service of other people. Right. So do you have any other things you want to tell our listeners about that you'd like to leave them with in, in this episode about having tragedy be our teacher and finding those silver linings in life? Well, I would just say this, and I, and I think it's, a, it's an important message that, you know, we don't want to have tragedy. Tragedy is something that we, we wish for. But when it does come, there are often... Uh, opportunities it may be a challenge at first but there are opportunities to find silver linings in that tragedy um or even through change you know uh i shared with, with you earlier if you lose your job you know a silver lining to losing your job i mean that can be a big scary thing for sure uh but uh it's also an opportunity to go and reinvent yourself, uh, to go back to school, learn something new, and maybe do something more in line with who you are today, not who you were at your 20 something self. Uh, so there's always uh, opportunities to like take those silver linings or take change or adversity or challenges or tragedy and sort of flip them on their head. And I, I would uh, argue that almost every circumstance is like that. And so what I would like to encourage people to do is to always consider when you're facing a challenge, try and find the silver lining. Try not to focus too much on the why something has happened to you, but how you can kind of get past it. And for me anyways, that's how I do it. And uh, it takes practice every single day. But uh, I think um, if you can get there, uh, it can cultivate a habit of appreciation. And I would say that almost any tragedy, even the worst, uh, there can be a silver lining that comes as a result of it. Wow. And that uh, says a lot uh, coming from you. And I imagine when you first decided to become a police officer, that some of the things that led you to that still apply today. So if you could put yourself back in time, you said it's about 24 years or so ago that you joined the force. 
So what led you to doing that? What did you, what drove you towards going into this career? So, I mean, for anybody that ever thought about a career in law enforcement, they would understand this, but it's just something that is, it's something that you, you just want to do. There's no real reason for why you, you want to do it. It's just almost for me anyways, it felt like kind of like a calling, but uh, my interest in uh, law enforcement began actually because I had a grandfather I never knew. He was a police officer in 1904 to 14. He was uh, 30 years senior to my grandmother. And so, um, of course, uh, yeah, if you can do the math there, you would know that uh, he was uh, he was dead, dead uh, by the time I ever came around. And so my mom had collected a whole bunch of memorabilia and articles about him back in like the early 1900s in New York, uh, him on a beat walking around. And I used to picture sort of what that would look like, you know, these, you know, these small rise buildings and steam coming up and dimly lit street lamps. And you're chasing bad guys over rooftops, a very sort of Hollywood concept. Anyways, these were kinds of the things that I, I, I remember and uh, uh, learning about. And so it was sort of, I guess, the first thing that sort of sparked the interest in law enforcement. And uh, I never knew him, but um, learning about him is kind of what got me the drive uh, to, to start a career uh, like one that he had. So I'm the only person that's ever followed in his footsteps, but uh, it's been a very rewarding opportunity. Wow. So those those early visions you had of chasing bad guys, it, I mean, it came to fruition, just not over rooftops, I imagine. Uh, no, not over rooftops. Never did I chase a bad guy over a rooftop. Actually, one of my favorite lessons just uh, when I was young and I was, uh, uh, you know, as a young police officer, you're always full of, uh, you know, piss and vinegar is what I say. Um, but you're always sort of ramped up and you're always, um, you think you're kind of the coolest cop in Calgary as you, as you drive around the mean streets. And uh, foot chases and things like that were always fun. But I remember getting in a foot chase years ago with an old senior partner of mine. And he stayed in the car and I chased this guy over fences and through yards and all that other kind of stuff. And he drove the car around the block and caught him sort of right as he was kind of tiring out. And at the end of it all, he said to me, you know, I don't know why when you're chasing guys over fences that you're not looking for gates. And uh, he was right. You know, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do things, but uh, looking for the gate sometimes is the easiest thing to do. And uh, the thing that you don't think of when you're a young fella. So what, what a good yeah story. I can totally visualize that. So thank you. Thank you for speaking with us today, Dave. And I'm really looking forward to part two which will come out in two weeks' time on unlikely connections, premonitions, and the power to make a difference. So thank you and stay well. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Where Work Meets Life. If you enjoyed this content, please rate and review the podcast as that helps me get it out to more people. Visit my website at Dr. Laura. Dot live and sign up for my monthly e-newsletter full of tips and resources. Please engage with us on social media and check out the podcast summary for links to my psychology practices, Canada Career Counseling, Calgary Career Counseling, and Synthesis Psychology. Stay well.